If you have felt like this morning's been a little rushed, 8.53, look. Pretty good. 8.53. That's, we were shooting. For, well, that's perfect. 8.50, that's, that's exactly perfect. We are going to do something today that we, I have never done. It's never happened here. Um, we're going to watch a video. This last uh, July, August, Orlean and I were in Anaheim, California at General Council. And this uh, Robert Morris, you see on the bulletin here, the bulletin cover, he spoke to about six to 8,000 of us pastors, missionaries that were there. And man, it was, just, it was just an insightful, great time. It really was. Just addressing this idea of of giving, what are the motives? Giving is a lifestyle. And then at the very end, he talked about tithing, but he just talked about this idea of giving. And just an incredible thing. So I thought about internalizing the information and then, you know, sharing with you. And I thought, you know, this guy did a pretty good job. <laughs> he did a really good job. So I'm like, we are going to watch a video. We're going to do something we've never seen. I really want you to have you pay attention because the one thing that we are missing watching it by video is. The same thing that you, you miss watching a race on TV or a, a hockey game or a baseball game on TV, you miss the ambiance. So try to imagine you're sitting in an auditorium, the guy is live, there's six to 8,000 of us pastors and missionaries and spouses there, and then he speaks. Um, Dr. Robert Morris is a senior pastor at Gateway Church in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, it's, it's a church, one of these multi-church campus sites. So there's some people that watch videos every week of him, so we're just going to be joining them today. Yeah, they started the church in 2000. Today, with all their campuses, they have about 36,000 active members. He does a weekly TV show on the blessed life. He's on the chairman of the board of the King's University. Does, does King's University sound familiar to anybody? Kind of church on the way, Van Nuys, California, Jack Hayford. I cut out a lot of the introductory stuff that he did, and we're just going to watch the solid thing getting there. But um, when he was being introduced, uh, George Wood, our then general superintendent, in, uh, introduced him as the fourth person. No, he referred to Jack Hayford as the fourth person of the Trinity, which he didn't mean to be blasphemous at all. But if you've been around Pentecostal circles, you, have the, you, you get a sense of the incredible high respect the life that uh, Jack Hayford has put into uh, Pentecostal leadership and studies. Um, I was delighted to have a picture of Jack Hayford sitting on my motorcycle a couple years ago up at Lake Geneva. I said, Pastor Hayford, would you come get on my motorcycle? Yeah, I said, I'd like to give you a ride. He goes, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> he said, I'll, I'll, I can sit on there for you so you can take a picture. I said, oh, that'd be fine too. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, but you'd have a fun ride if I gave you a ride. Um, he's the best-selling author of 11 books. He and his wife, Debbie, have been married 37 years. He's got three children, three married children, and six grandchildren. So I want to encourage you to get your, get your pens ready, to write in your Bibles. Or He's not going to, there's a couple scripture verses. You got to catch right at the beginning, but then just enjoy this presentation. Amen? Amen. Uh, okay, so if you'd like to turn to two passages of scriptures, or if you'd like to click to two passages of scriptures, uh, we're going to read in Matthew 7. The scriptures will be on the screen, so, um, so that might be easier. But we're going to read Matthew 7 and then Luke 6. We're going to start there. Um, but here's the title of the message, and I normally have short titles and short points, and this is a longer title. The title of the message is, Don't Apologize for Preaching God's Word. And every point will begin with those words, and then we'll add a prepositional phrase at the end. So don't apologize for preaching God's Word and then we'll add something to it, okay? So let me tell you where this message came from. Some of you know I wrote a, a book called The Blessed Life, and it's on giving. Uh, my wife and I, by God's grace, the Lord called us to give all the proceeds of the book away, uh, and it's been able to be a huge blessing to the kingdom. We're grateful for that. But um, probably now, I would say 10 or 12 years ago, a uh, pastor called me, and I didn't know him at the time. Uh, I know him now, and uh, we've gone to lunch, and we've been in conferences together. Um, but when I saw the, the note, you know, uh, and the name, back, it was back then, you, you got a note, the little tear-off note that your assistant would give you, you know, that someone had called. That's, that's how long ago it was. I saw his name, and of course recognized his name, and he's pastor of a well-known seeker church. 
Now, so it's not Bill or Rick, so let me just say that because immediately everyone's trying to figure it out. But anyway, um, and I don't think he'd mind me sharing his name, but I've never asked him. So, but anyway, um, I re- I saw, when I saw his name, I got a word from the Lord for him. And he's a secret church pastor. So, you know, we, we are a charismatic church. We believe in baptism, Holy Spirit, tongues, everything. So deliverance, you know. Um, so I didn't know whether he even believed in prophecy or God speaking, but I got a word immediately. And so I called him back and um, he said, brother, I'm reading the best book on giving I've ever read, referring to the book that I'd written. And then he said something jokingly, and all of you that are pastors will understand this. He said, I, I'm about to preach a series on it and I'm not going to give you any credit, you know. <laughs> and I said, well, that's okay because I don't give you credit when I use your stuff either. So that's fine with me. Um, so we talked for a while, and it was real pleasant, great conversation. And then I said to him, I said, hey, when, when I saw that you had called, I feel like the Lord put something on my heart to share with you. So would you mind if I share that with you? And his response was, give it to me with both barrels and don't hold anything back. And I thought, man, that's great. So I told him, I said, well, here's what the Lord told me to tell you. You need to stop apologizing when you preach on giving. Uh, In other words, you don't apologize when you preach on faith. You don't apologize when you preach on prayer. You don't apologize when you preach on grace. You don't apologize when you preach on marriage and family. It's because you know you're helping the people. And I said, I'm not saying that you would actually say, I'm gonna preach on giving, I'm sorry. I'm not saying you'd actually apologize. But you don't, I said, I don't know this by natural knowledge, but I said, you don't preach on giving with the same boldness and the same confidence that you preach on other subjects. And it's because Satan has lied to you and told you that you have an ulterior motive when you preach on giving. And that happens to many pastors. Many pastors will will feel like, well, if I preach on giving, it's gonna help the church out. And so uh, people are gonna think I have an ulterior motive and so I'm gonna back off and soften the message a little bit. Here's the only problem with that. If you preach on marriage, that's gonna help the church too, right? So do you have an ulterior motive? When you preach on grace, that's gonna help the church. You preach on faith, that's gonna help the church. Preach on the person and power of the Holy Spirit, that's gonna help the church. You don't back off any other subject. So why would you back off of giving? Because Jesus, by the way, did not back off of giving. 16 out of 38 parables have to do with giving and possessions. So it's it's unbelievable, and I'm gonna show you a little more about giving in a moment. So I said to him, you need to stop apologizing when you preach on giving. And the phone got real quiet. I didn't know if he'd hung up. You know, I didn't know what at that time. And he said to me in a moment, brother, that is a word from God for me. And I receive it. And so he preached with boldness. And their tithe doubled. Doubled. He did a six-week series. Their tithe doubled and never went down from that point on, never went below that. And a year later, we got together for lunch at, and the church had been going 20 years at that time, and he said to me, the most successful uh, CD uh, sermon series sales from CDs, and obviously we don't do it to sell CDs, we, but we want people to get it so they hear the whole thing if they were on vacation or something. He said, the most successful selling sermon series by twice as much is that series I did on giving, which shows that people would like to be taught what the Bible says about giving. So here's point number one. Don't apologize for preaching God's word about giving. Don't apologize for preaching God's word about giving. So the reason I want to show you Matthew 7 and Luke 6 uh, in conjunction is that uh, it's, it's the same sermon, but Luke 6 adds something that I personally believe we take out of context. So Matthew 7, uh, look at verses 1 and 2. It says, judge not that you be not judged, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, if you had to say what the subject or the topic or the theme of those two verses is in one word, what would you say? Something like judging, right? Let me me read you that first verse again, uh, the first, uh, just a little bit of the second too. And I'm gonna emphasize one word to make sure that we are, we have the context of this passage, okay? All right, so everyone ready? Judge, 
not. And you will not be judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. Now, what would you say is the subject <clears throat> or the theme or the main topic of those two verses? Judging, right? Okay, so let, let's, let's just for a moment, before we go to Luke 6, let's repeat that first phrase. Uh, if you'll just say it out loud after I say it, judge not and you will not be judged. And then the last sentence, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Okay, now Luke 6, verse 37 says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Verse 38, the last sentence says, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. I know of no theologian, no, I don't know of any theologian that would disagree. This is the same passage. This is Luke picking up passages from the Sermon on the Mount. I, I know of no theologian that would disagree with that. I think any of you that teach in a college or seminary, you would be able to recognize that Matthew 7 and Luke 6 are parallel passages. Here's the problem. I want to show you uh, something in between. And I asked you a moment ago what Matthew 7, what the theme was, and all of us agreed judging. Let me go back for a moment and ask you about Matthew 7. Is there anything in Matthew 7, 1 and 2 that's about money? It's not a trick question. I, I know pastors like trick people. You do it too, and it's fun, but this isn't a trick question. Is there anything, did we see the word money in Matthew 7, 1 and 2? Did we? No. And we all agreed it was about judging. Right? Okay. So Luke 6, watch what's between verse 37 and the last phrase of verse 38. You already know, but watch. Verse 37, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your bosom, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Okay. So what's the subject? What's the theme? What's the context? of those verses we just read. It's judging. It's not money. As a matter of fact, I want you to look very closely at your Bibles. Does the word money appear anywhere in Luke 6, verses 37 and 38? Come on. <laughs> look at your Bibles. Does the word money appear in those two verses? Why do we always refer to money when we read verse Luke 6, 38? Here's the reason. Uh, I, I have a little pet peeve. Um, uh, it's not that uh, pastors uh, don't understand Greek. Um, it's that they don't understand English. <laughs> um, I refer to myself as a grammarian, but grammarians probably wouldn't. Um, and, uh, and I love math. I love grammar and math. Those are my two strongest subjects, and they were in school. Um, so, so let me, I'm just very briefly give you a, a grammar lesson here. Uh, in Luke 6, 38, give is the verb. You is the implied subject, you know, uh, hence the word implied because you don't see you in there. You give and it, it is an objective pronoun. Uh, so you have to put something in place of it to understand what it's talking about. You give and whatever you give will be given back to you. But let's take it in context. He said, don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Let me say it another way. Give judgment and judgment will be given back to you. Give condemnation and condemnation will be given back to you. I don't hear a lot of this preached in the body of Christ. But that's the context. Whatever you give that's going to be given back to you. And when we talk about judgment and condemnation, let me give you the good news. Good measure, press down, <laughs> shaken together, and running over will people give judgment to you because you gave judgment. I probably should have said the bad news, not the good news. I, I, I was counseling with a, a woman one time 
and she couldn't find the babysitter. We said, go ahead, bring the kids, and, and my assistant agreed to watch them. We had the door open. The kids were playing in the assistant's office. I was talking to her. This happened. This, this woman said to me, uh, my children yell at me. She said, they yell at me. While she's telling me this, she said, y'all be quiet out there. I immediately thought of Luke 6, 38. <laughs> Give yelling, and yelling will be given back to you. Are, are y'all following me? And I'm sure you know the good measure pressed down, shaking and running over, but if you don't, uh, they were terms that Israeli uh, farmers were very familiar with. Uh, they had, there were two types of people working in the field, uh, hired workers and poor people. God said, leave the corners of the field for the poor people, for the poor and so there are two types of people filling their baskets. The workers are getting a denarius a day, you know, uh, and so when they fill their basket and they have to walk over to the cart, put it where the oxen's pulling the cart, you know. So they didn't fill it real full because the, 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 the um, heavier, then it'd be heavier, you know. So they, they would just fill it up halfway or whatever and go over and dump it and they'd go back and they'd be talking, telling jokes, fill it up halfway. So not a poor person. A poor person would put a good measure in his basket. And then a poor person would uh, press it down. And a poor person then would shake it to get it to settle. And then a poor person would put so much in it that it would run over the way Ruth filled her basket, you know, where it was running over. And, and, uh, I mean, and Boaz commanded the young men to watch over her and, and catch what fell from her basket, you know. So, so here's what he was saying. Whatever you give, you're going to get more back with God. And we know that. In other words, if you give an apple seed, you don't get back one apple seed. You get back a tree that has many apples and many seeds. So you always get more than what you give. The only problem with that is that it works in reverse as well. So if you're an angry person, you're going to get anger back. If you're a judgmental person, you're going to get judgment back. That's what, I'm not taking this out of context. I'm putting it in context. So can you use this, you know, when you're uh, asking people to give, can you use this, can you put money in there? Yes, you can. Because later on up, uh, I mean, not later, previously, uh, verse 30 says, give to everyone who asks of you, ask for your, you know, uh, coat, give them your shirt too, uh, loan and don't expect anything back. That's called giving. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so yes, 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 it works in the financial realm too. But here's what I want to say about this. Luke 6, 38 is not the motive Forgiving, it is the reward for giving with the right heart. And that's what we need to teach our people. Because we teach this as, as a motivation. You know, we say, give and you'll get, give and you'll get, give and you'll get. So they say, oh, well, I want to get. So I wonder if God is thinking, praise me. You know, he wouldn't say praise the Lord. Praise me. Ever, all of my people, I'm so excited, all of my people are catching the revelation of getting. And that's normally the way we preach giving. And I personally, I'm gonna, I like to make statements with semicolons. Again, I like grammar. So, so if I made this statement with a period, it wouldn't be true. But this, period, this statement has a semicolon, okay? God does not bless giving. Semicolon. He blesses giving with the right heart. See, have you ever thought about this? Why did God invent giving? Why, why did he create giving? Why did he invent giving? Because God invented it. No person invented it. God invented it. So why did God invent this? Uh, I was asking a, a Bible college class just a while back, and a uh, little bright-eyed girl, you know, she said, to support the work of his kingdom. So I said, okay, let, let's think about that for a moment. Do you really believe, do you really believe, honestly, that God needs our money to support his ministry? Do you really believe that? God did not invent giving for his sake. He invented giving for our sake. He invented giving to work greed and selfishness out of our lives. But the way giving is preached many times works greed and selfishness back into our lives. 
That's what's wrong with the hyper prosperity uh, message. And I do believe in biblical prosperity, uh, but there is a, like a, a hyper prosperity message being preached and a hyper poverty message being preached. I believe in the hyper provisional message being preached that God wants to provide for you so you can bless other people. So um, again, give is a verb, but we always tend to put money behind it. Okay, so I'm not at money yet. I said don't apologize, preach God's word on giving. Giving is a verb. Um, it's an action. It, it involves more than money. I was being interviewed one time for one of the Christian magazines, and the guy said to me, uh, how often do you preach on giving? And without even thinking, I said, uh, every week. And the guy said, what? I said, every week. He said, you preach on giving every week. I said, yeah. He said, oh, oh, I I understand. You mean you give a little giving sermon before you pass the plate? And I said, well, actually, we've never passed the plate. 17 years, we've never passed the plate at Gateway Church. Now, that's that's neither here nor there is what God told me to do. It's not a more spiritual or less spiritual thing. We just have boxes on the wall, and and we just felt that that was the best way for us to do it. But I said, no, we've never passed the plate, so we don't give a giving uh, little sermon, and nothing wrong with it if that's the way God lets you to do it. Um, So I said, no, I don't do that. He said, well, but you preach on giving every week. I said, yeah. I said, but let me clarify something. You asked me how often I preach on giving. What I think you meant to ask me is how often I preach on giving money. But you didn't ask that. And I preach on giving money about every three years. About every three years, and I would do it every year if God led me, but when I feel led, just like you as a pastor, you preach when God leads you, and it's worked out about every three years at Gateway Church that I do a series on giving. But I said, you didn't ask me how often I preach on giving money. You asked me how often I preach on giving. And I said, I can't preach on uh, prayer without preaching on giving because you've got to give your time to pray. Uh, I, I said, I can't preach on faith without preaching on giving. I can't preach on grace. I mean, that's giving. God gave. can't preach on grace without preaching on giving. Uh, I said, I can't preach on marriage without preaching on giving. That's a definite, because <laughs> you, you cannot be selfish and stay married. That's no way. You know, I wonder if, if when they created Adam, they said, you know, we know he's going to fall, and we know he's going to have a problem with selfishness, so what should we do to work selfishness out of him? And, and, and one of them said, one of the Trinity said, let's make him live with someone. <laughs> and then if that doesn't do it, let's give him children. <laughs> So, so I told this reporter, I, can't, you, you, I wanted you to widen your mindset that preaching on giving is not money. It, it's an action. Um, I'll give you another little grammar thing, I think. Sometimes I, I, I remember thinking one time, what's the smallest complete sentence that would encapsulate the Bible? Now, the smallest complete sentence in the Bible, obviously, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. But a complete sentence, just to remind you, I know some of you are thinking, I hate him talking about grammar and I hated the purple-haired lady that taught me grammar. But anyway, um, to have a complete sentence, you have to have a subject and verb. You can have an exclamatory sentence like, wow. I can even say it backward. <laughs> so you can, but to have a complete sentence, you have to have a subject and verb, it must. And so, um, so what's the complete sentence of the Bible, the smallest complete sentence that would encapsulate the whole Bible? So again, I asked this Bible college class, I said, what's the subject of the Bible? And little 18-year-old girl, she said, we are. Uh, I said, "Uh, no, um, as you get older, you're going to find out that the world does not revolve around you, sweetie. But (laughs) I said, you're the object of the Bible. You're the object, but you're not the subject. The subject is God. God loved us. Before we ever loved him, God loved us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. God is the subject of the Bible. So what's the verb? Most people would say love. I want to humbly disagree with that and give you maybe something else to think about. I think the subject is give. I mean the verb is give. Here's the reason. I think the great, what we call the greatest verse in the Bible proves it. For God so loved <laughs> that he gave. Okay, let me ask you a question. What if God had just loved and not given? We'd still be on our way to hell. If God loved you but didn't give Jesus for you, you'd still, we'd still be going to hell. If God had not given, given Christ, we would not be here today. 
If Christ had not given his life, he said, no one takes it from me. I lay it down or I give it. If he had not given his life, we would not be here today. If you had not given your life to Christ, you would not be here today. If you had not given this time to come to Los Angeles, to come to Anaheim, you would not be here today. You gave to get here. It's all through the Bible. So, I make this statement. I think we're the most like God when we give. I really believe it. And I think preaching on giving will do more for your church. The action of giving. Now, I know this is going to shock you. I believe in preaching the whole counsel of God. But I think it will do more for your church than any subject, any verb you can preach. Because when you talk about the Holy Spirit, we need to give our lives to the Holy Spirit. We need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. When you preach on grace, faith, whatever it is, a person has to give. It's an action. It, 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 you'll have more volunteers than you've ever had before because people will give their time. You'll have more resources than you've ever had. You'll have more people getting saved because they, you have to give your time to witness to people. You follow what I'm saying? So I've seen this produce incredible results. So the first point is don't apologize for preaching God's Word about giving. Here's point two. Don't apologize for preaching God's Word about money. Notice these are different sub- subjects we're talking about here. Don't apologize for preaching God's Word about money. Jesus didn't. He talked about money. Um, if they don't learn about money from us, from the pastors and leaders in the body of Christ, where are they going to learn about money? From uh, Visa? Visa? Here's a, here's a real rhetorical question from our government. <laughs> no. They need to learn about money from the Bible, from God's Word. And God's Word has a lot to say about money and possessions. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, the word mammon. It's in the Bible four times, uh, but it's repeated uh, once. One, is, one time it's the same in Matthew and Luke. So it's the, um, so really, as far as we know, Jesus used the word three times. Uh, but in Luke 16, uh, let me go through this passage and talk a little bit about mammon because it's going to relate to money. Luke 16, verse 9, Jesus said, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, you probably know this, but I've got to address that. That doesn't mean use your money to make friends so that when you're short, they'll help you. That's not what that means at all. What it means, obviously, the word fail means die, if you go to the Greek, and make friends with unrighteous man that when you die, they'll receive you into your everlasting home. In other words, you're going to be greeted in heaven by people in Africa or some other country where you gave that you don't even know, and because that God took unrighteous mammon and turned it into true riches. True riches are people. So that's, that's the first sentence there. Okay, then verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. This could do with money and people. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, simply money, and we'll talk about what mammon represents, who will commit to your trust the true riches? People. But please hear this, pastors. If you can't even handle your own budget, God's never going to give you people because those are the true riches. It's very important how you handle finances, yours and the church's. And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, possibly, obviously, that would refer to what is Jesus's, the people don't belong to us, could also refer to that maybe you want to be a senior pastor someday and you're an associate pastor and you're not faithful with that person's sheep that God gave entrusted him with, why would God give you your own? If you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? then this is the verse, verse 13, that is repeated in in Matthew. No servant can serve two masters. No, it's none. It's it's totally impossible. Either he will hate the one, this is Jesus talking, and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I'm going to explain to you what mammon is, but before I do, I just want to clarify um, that you cannot preach a mammon doctrine and have people love God. This is to me what the the trouble with the hyper-prosperity message does. 
uh, here's what he said. You're going to be loyal to one and despise the other. So if you preach a hyper-prosperity message, you know, if, you, if y'all give, if you give, you know, you're never going to have a problem. You have a money tree in your backyard. You're going to drive a Cadillac, have a Rolls Royce and, you know, a, a Rolex or whatever it is. Okay, you preach that when the washing machine goes out at their house, they actually despise God because they've been loyal to a mammon-centered message. So let me tell you what mammon is. You you probably know this. You may have studied it. Mammon is an Aramaic word, uh, and it it represents the Syrian god of riches. It actually came out of Babylon. Uh, Babel, on, all of you know this. Babel means confusion, and some of Babel's own. (laughs) Same same spelling as Babylon, you know. Uh, But uh, it means sown in confusion. So Babylon was when people thought that they could do something without God. They could reach to heaven. They didn't need God. They had enough provision on their own, of course. So this Syrian God of riches came out of that. I think that when Jesus was talking, some, some lexicons will define this as riches, but there was a God of riches that day, and that's what I think he was talking about. Uh, so you could say you can't serve God in riches, but I know a lot of wealthy people serve God. They just don't serve riches. They might have them. But the point is, he's saying you can't serve this deity, this false deity, this spirit that rests on money. I think all money has a spirit on it. I think it either has the spirit of mammon on it or it has the spirit of God on it. And the way you redeem it is you give the first 10% to God. And then the rest is redeemed or blessed out from under that mammon spirit. In other words, the, the finances that I have cannot be devoured by the devourer because we have consecrated them to God by giving him the first 10%. So we've redeemed it out from this mammon spirit. Um, I do believe mammon is a spirit, uh, and uh, one of the reasons is um, if mammon is not a spirit, how come it can talk? (laughs) Because every time we pass the plate, mammon talks. Mammon tells us things. Mammon tries to replace God. Mammon tries to take the place of God. Mammon will promise you everything that only God can give you. Mammon will promise you happiness, uh, identity, uh, security, uh, independence, power, freedom. Mammon will promise you respect. Mammon will say things like, you know, if you had more money, people would respect you. Uh, mammon will tell you that you'll have a better marriage if you have more money. You don't need more money to have a better marriage. You need more God. See, it's a complete contrast. It's totally contrasting. Uh, I'll, I'll lay a heavy one on you. I believe mammon is the spirit of the Antichrist. And you might be saying, well, where do you get that from? Well, I'll tell you, it's a very famous scripture, and you know the scripture. You know the scripture. The Antichrist does not rule through the threat of nuclear war. The Antichrist spirit rules through the threat of not being able to buy and sell. That's the spirit of mammon. Uh, Mammon uh, tells us, you know, if you had more, here's the one mammon tells pastors, okay? (laughs) If you had more money, you could reach more people. There's a real problem with that. Money doesn't reach people. The Holy Spirit reaches people. Uh, As a matter of fact, I'm going to say something, and you're going to laugh because you've had this thought, and I've had this thought, but you're going to laugh like you're pretending that you know other people have had this thought. (laughs) Have you ever had the thought, this is the contrast of God and mammon, I either need God to come through or I need someone to give me some money. Ow. And if, if someone would give me some money, it's okay, Lord, I don't need you now. My problem got solved. That's mammon influencing all of us. We were born in a mammon-ruled world. We were born again in a God-ruled world, so we just have to renew our minds. We have to understand it's God. Jesus never told anyone that the answer to his problems was more money. Never. Son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, You just need more money. (laughs) Never one time. The answer to your church growing is not more money. It's more God. 
God can take care of all the resource problems. So and here's point number three. Don't apologize for preaching God's word about tithing. So I said, don't apologize for preaching God's word about money. I mean, about, about giving. That was number one. Number two, don't apologize for preaching God's word about money. Number three, don't apologize for preaching God's word about tithing. Okay, there's a whole bunch of... Um, Boy, I thought of a word there that I can't use. Uh, (laughs) Preachers can't use that word. Whole lot of theological dung about tithing. (laughs) Dung's in the Bible. (laughs) Old old King James, but it's still the Bible. Um, (laughs) Don't get caught up in this thing. There's a principle behind, behind tithing that goes much farther than 10%. It's the principle of first. It's the principle of putting God first. Who's first in your life? I can tell you who's first in your life, by the way, if you let me see your check register. Simple. So where's the first 10% go? Where's the first? So let me show you this principle in, in Scripture by using the firstborn and first fruits. okay, just for a moment. Um, Exodus 23, verse 19 says, the first of the first fruits of your land. Now, that's amazing because God says, you know, uh, I know uh, that y'all are going to come like the disciples and say, what did that mean? So I'm going to have to make it real clear what I'm talking about when I say first fruits. The first of your first fruits of your land you shall bring, please notice the word bring, into the house of the Lord your God. Notice the house of the Lord your God. Okay. So it doesn't go to a television ministry, doesn't go to a Christian school, doesn't go to missionary, not the tithe. It goes to the house of God. Those are offerings over and above. And notice the word bring. God does not use the word give when he talks about tithing. He uses the word bring because you can't give what doesn't belong to you. You can only bring it. Uh, You know, like, let's say that when I came to the conference, I said to Dr. Wood, "Uh, Dr. Wood, um, could we use your car while we're here just to drive around? We're going to do a little shopping, sightseeing and all. And he said, sure. So he gives me the keys to the car. I said, I won't need it. I'll be at the conference. Someone can take me if I need to. So at the end of the conference, I have... Dr. Wood's keys to his personal car, and I come up to him and I say, Dr. Wood, um, Debbie and I prayed, and um, we'd like to give you this car. <laughs> I, you know, for he, ha, 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 Pastor Robert, um, that's my car. Yeah, I know, we'd like to give it to you. <laughs> his response would be, you're not giving me this car, you're returning it. See, we don't give the tithes. We don't pay the tithes either. It's not a bill or a tax. We bring it, we return it to the house of God. So we need to teach our people that. By the way, you also can't designate your tithe. We don't let any members designate their tithe. They can designate gifts to the building, but not the tithe. You can't designate it because it doesn't belong to you. You can only return it. Or there is another option, you can steal it. Only two options with the tithe is bring it to the house of God or steal it. And God uses the word steal if that offends you. He uses it in Joshua when he talks about Achan, the the people have stolen. And he uses it in Malachi, you've robbed me. So, and by the way, what I believe he's done when he says robbed, it says, if for years I never understood part of that verse. You know how when you don't understand part of the verse, you don't preach that part. You know, you just preach the rest of it. It said, they said, in what way have we robbed you? He said, in tithes and offerings. I thought, well, I know how we'd rob in tithe because the tithe belongs to him. Leviticus 27 says the tithe is mine. It belongs to me. It's mine. So that's how we, but how could we rob God in offerings? Here's what I really believe Malachi 3 is saying. He's saying, you rob me of the opportunity to bless you. I want to open the windows of heaven over you and pour out such blessing there will not be room enough to receive it. And... And that's kind of like if you call right now. <laughs> and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'm going to tell you what, it's a whole lot better having God rebuke the devil than standing in a room yelling at him. So I think what he's actually saying, Malachi, and I do believe in spiritual warfare and prayer, so don't, don't you know. <laughs> it's amazing when you're preaching to theologians how they say, well, does he not believe now? Okay, so don't worry about all that, okay? I believe in rebuking the devil, I believe in resisting him, okay. Uh, I have no clue where I was going there. 
Okay, point is, I think God said you robbed me of a blessing. By the way, when my daughter, you saw her and her husband there, when her um, husband-to-be wanted to date her, I set up rules. And he came to me and asked me, and I set up guidelines, and he followed all of them. That's why he got the prize. <laughs> and, um, but they, when they started dating officially, uh, they were standing around in front of the pulpit after a young adult service. And there were about seven or eight of them, and they started joking with him and my daughter about what it was like to date the pastor's daughter. And one of them said to my daughter, you know, uh, your dad is so strong on tithing I'll bet he even checks the tithing records of the guys that want to date you. And my daughter said, he does. (laughs) And I did. Here, real simple. Why would I give my daughter to a thief? Not only would he steal, but he'd steal from God. And this verse too, if he can't handle money, he can't handle true riches. And my daughter's true riches. And if he, another way to say it is, if he can't even handle something as simple as money, he definitely can't handle my daughter because my daughter is a handful. <laughs> By the way, I'll just let you know, and I, whether she can do it or not, but she's 27, mother of three, but she preaches in women's conferences and young adult conferences all over the world. She's, she's spoken with Lisa Bevere, Chris Kane. Chris Kane's on her board. She's spoken with Beth Moore, uh, Charlotte Gamble, uh, Priscilla Shire, and it's really good sometimes if you have a women's conference or something to bring in a young speaker like that that can speak uh, because it lets the young ladies know, I don't have to wait until I'm 50 to do something for God. So... Anyway, I just, I, I wasn't trying to promote her. I just thought there's a, there is a need, and Dr. Wood, thank you for going from 15% to 25% women ministers. Thank you for leading the way in that area. But you've probably found that it's difficult to get good women speakers and teachers of God's Word who are solid theologically, and so that's, I just thought I'd share it with you. So, all right, so let's keep going here. Uh, Exodus, I'm going to go to Exodus 13. I know the PowerPoint says Proverbs 3. But can you go on to Exodus 13? Oh, great. All right. Verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, consecrate, we all know that means set aside or set apart to me, all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both a man and beast, it is mine. Now, that's very emphatic in the Hebrew. It belongs to me. It's my property. Then verses 12 and 13, you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be, again, very similar, shall belong or shall be property of the Lord's, but every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. In other words, you're going to lose it anyway. 10% is going out of your account whether you bring it to God's house or not. It's going out. Uh, and all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Okay, so here's what this says. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, how do you know which to do? And when we read this, 1 Corinthians 10, let me remind you, says everything that happened to them happened as an example to us and is an instruction for us. So what's the principle behind sacrificing or redeeming the firstborn? Well, he gives two animals, lamb and donkey. A lamb is exemplary of clean animals. A donkey is exemplary of unclean animals. And here's here's how you know whether it's sacrifice or redeem. If your clean animal has a firstborn, you must sacrifice it. If your unclean animal has a firstborn, you have to redeem it. You know, we all know that means purchase it back because it belongs to God. You have to redeem it with the sacrifice of a clean. So one more time, clean animal, clean firstborn has to be sacrificed unclean firstborn has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. So what does this have to do with us today? Two questions. Was Jesus born clean or unclean? Clean, right? No sin. Born of a virgin. Okay. So Jesus was born clean. Firstborn son of God, the Bible says. Okay. Was, were you and I born clean or unclean? Unclean. We were born in sin, sin nature, right? And I can ask the experts here, the parents, Real simple question. We can prove that children are born with a sin nature. Did you have to teach your children 
to be bad? Or did it come naturally for them? Yeah, we had to teach them to be good, all right? So, we were born unclean, Jesus was born clean. Here's what we just read in Exodus 13. Here's the principle behind it. The clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. That's what we just read. That's what that represents. So I think, in a, in a way, that Jesus is God's tithe. Because you give the tithe first. You don't pay your bills and see if you have left, no, enough left over to tithe. You don't wait until your uh, sheep has 10 lambs. God didn't say you can wait till it has 10 lambs and give me one of them and you can give me the one you don't like that keeps getting in the garden, right? He said, you give me the first one. So it took faith, took faith to give the first one. God gave Jesus, and Romans even says in hope, and that word is the root of the word faith. God gave Jesus in faith that we would believe. He didn't wait for us to straighten up. God gave Jesus when we were mocking him and beating him and spitting on him and nailing him to a cross. So that's what we want to teach our people. Tithing is much more than 10%. It's bringing the first to God. So we just read the firstborn and first fruits belong to God. Uh, when I was in uh, college, uh, one of the students asked one of the professors, why did God accept Abel's offering and he didn't accept Cain's? And the professor was real honest. He said, you know, I, I really don't know. When I saw the principle of firstborn and firstborn, first fruits, it's easy. You'll see it too. Uh, Genesis 4, 3 through 5. And in the process of time, those are very important words. Just in the, it just kind of came about in the process of time that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Notice it specifically does not say first fruits. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Did you see it? Simple. Uh, Abel brought the firstborn. He was a rancher. Cain was a farmer. He did not bring first fruits. He just gave an offering in the process of time. Let me bring that up to modern day language. Cain gave what he wanted when he wanted. And God said, I'm not accepting that. I will not accept that. So there's a theological reason that God could not accept it. Uh, you, you know, many of you preach the attributes of God. I think that's one of the best series you can ever do is who God is, not just what he does. But um, so let me just, just go through just a couple and show you why God not only could not, but he not only would not, but he could not, okay? Um, we know that uh, God can't lie. We, just, we know that because God is truth. He doesn't just tell the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am truth. I am truth. So God can't lie. Uh, there are some other things God can't do that, that um, maybe you haven't thought about them in this way. They're kind of humorous when you think about them in this way. God can't change. We all know this is the immutability of God, comes from the word mute or mutate, uh, so God can't change. It's impossible for God to change. The reason God can't change is because God's perfect. If God could change, that means he could get better, and he can't get better because he's best, right? So he can't change. Here's one I really like to think about with God. God cannot think the way we think. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but God can't think. This is the omniscience of God, omniscience, all knowledge. God knows everything at the same time. I want you to actually think about that some this next week because you'll trip a breaker thinking about that. <laughs> God knows everything at the same time. So let me say it another way. Nothing has ever occurred to God. <laughs> God has never said, you know what I just thought of? I just thought of something I've never thought of before <laughs> because he knows everything at the same time. So God's immutable. He's omniscient. Here's the reason why God could not accept Cain's offering, because God is preeminent. It means he's above all, higher than all, before all, and first of all. And he's even before the first. Eminent would mean above, a higher, before, but he's pre. He's preeminent. He's before the first. So God could not accept it because it wasn't first. And you see this through Scripture. God says it very clearly. He said, you bring me blind animals and lame animals, I do not accept them. Even in the law, he said, when he talked about the lamb, which was referring to Jesus, he said, it must be perfect with no blemish in it to be brought to me. So we need to teach our people to give the first to God. 
So let me give you an illustration. I told you I like math, so this is a math illustration. That means that a moment ago when we were talking about grammar, half of you liked it, half of you didn't. Now half of you are going to like this. Half of you like math, half of you hate math. I understand that. And you're married, by the way. Uh, so, <laughs> um, my father is a mathematical genius, certified mathematical genius. Uh, I'm not a mathematical genius. Apparently, it uh, skips a generation. Um, but, but numbers add up in my mind without me trying to get them to. They just add up in my mind without me even trying. They, they, you know, that just happens. So Debbie and I were buying something one time for eight dollars. And so the lady said to me, I'm going to have to add the uh, tax on the calculator because the cash register is broken. And I said, it's 66 cents. Just like that. It's 66 cents. And she looked at me, and then she did this, and she said, it's 66 cents. <laughs> I said, okay. We got out in the car, and Debbie said to me, how do you do that? Well, I thought that she was actually asking me <laughs> right, I, I thought she was asking me how I did it. I found out later she does not care. She could not care less <laughs> how I do it. She was just complimenting me. But so I told her, she asked me how do you do it, so I told her. I said, well, our tax rate's 8.25, 8 times 8 is 64, quarter of 8 is 2, 64 and 2 is 66. I said, that should happen in less than a second in your mind. <laughs> she said to me, it doesn't. <laughs> but I know what 25% off means. <laughs> I still thought she was talking math. <laughs> and so I said to her, okay, if you're buying something for $100 and it's 25% off, what does that mean? She said, it means it's a good deal. <laughs> and then she said this. Now, she's, she's brilliant, and she likes to play with me with math because she knows it's important to me. So she said, and then she said this to me, she said, and if it's 50% off, it's free. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then she does like this. <sighs> like, I don't understand math now, you know. <laughs> she said, Robert, everybody knows if it's 50% off, it's the same thing as buy one, get one free. So if it's 50% off, it's free. And then she said, and if it's 75% off, you're making money. Which explains some of the difficulties we've had in our checkbook over the years. Okay, so I'm going to give you a math illustration, real simple. Let's say you, to, to figure out how do we tithe first, let's say you own a landscape company, and uh, you come to my home, and I say, I want some plants and shrubs and trees, and so you say, okay, this is how much my uh, materials will cost, this is how much my labor will cost, and my profit will be $1,000. Is, is that agreeable, that entire cost to you, Pastor Robert? I say, yes, that's agreeable. So when, at the end of the job, I pay for your, all your materials, all your labor, and then I give you 10 $100 bills, $1,000 for your profit. I'm, I'm saying this because people need to know you tithe on your increase, your income, not, not your expenses and all. So it's whatever you, however you income, increase. So, uh, so anyway, so let's say I give you 10 $100 bills. So here's the math question, okay? So those of you, some of you can check out, well, you can come back in just a minute. So a tithe, it means a tenth, so you have 10 $100 bills in your hand, you have $1,000, so how much is the tithe? It's real simple, $100, right? Okay, but which one is the tithe? Now, we know the first one, we'll say the first one, but how do you know which one's the first one? It's real simple. It's the first one that leaves your hand. 
In other words, if you go home and you say, let me set aside some for the mortgage, some for the car, some for food, some for clothes, and here's God's part. That's not God's part. You gave God's part to the mortgage company, and the mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. Only God does. And here's what happens many times, set aside some for this, this, and this. Oh, there's not enough left over for God. He wouldn't accept it anyway. He accepts the first. He accepts the best, the highest. So we have to teach our people this. So I've told our congregation, this is how I tithe. Uh, I get paid on the 15th and the 30th. So on the 15th and 30th, in the morning, while I'm having my quiet time, I go online and immediately send the tithe to the church. So it's the first money that leaves my account. For us, since 1985, we've doubled tithe to the church, 20% of our income, meaning to the house of God, and then over above that, missionaries, universities, whatever God speaks to us to do. That's just for us. And I, and I say that because I believe God calls other people to that, and so I just want to say that. So anyway, and I tell the church that too. It's amazing how many people started double tithing when I just told the church what we did. Um, but anyway, and then also how many people started giving online. By the way, when the first time I ever shared about giving online, that I do it online, we had about 25% of our income coming in online, not on the weekends. It immediately went to 55%. Just me sharing how I did it. Our giving now is 75% online. People get 75% of their income comes in online. People, members of our church. So anyway, uh, I do it. So let's just say though that um, I, on the 15th, I have to get up for an early morning meeting and, uh, or you catch a plane and I forget. And later that night, I think, oh, it's the 15th, got paid today, I need to send the tithe. So I go online and I notice that Debbie has gone to the grocery store that day. I don't say, that's great, sugar, we're cursed. <laughs> we're cursed now because you gave the tithe to Kroger's and so we're cursed. No, because I'm not legalistic about it, and please hear me, I don't think God's legalistic about it. I think God just wants to know in your heart who's first. And when you preach it with grace to your people, they catch it. They catch it and they love it. Okay, so here's the close. And I'm actually, I still have 31 minutes, but I'm not going to take them, I promise. And we'll just turn it over and let Dr. Wood or whoever decide what to do. So here's, here's the, the close. Back in Exodus 13, when we talked about the first, God said, your son is going to come and ask you why you do this. Now, you think about this. The son grows up in a home where the father kills lambs and baby animals. He kills them, cuts their throat. Um, let's say one day the son runs into the kitchen and says, Mom, Dad, Mom, the, the sheep is having a lamb, and it's her first one. Oh, great. And they, so they all go out to the barn, but the father picks the butcher knife up on the way. And then they all gather around. They say, oh, look. It's the miracle of life. Oh, look, he's standing up. He's standing up. And then the father grabs this little lamb by the hind legs, picks it up, and cuts its throat. And the son's watching this. He's, you know what he's thinking. He's thinking, don't mess with dad. <laughs> I don't know what that lamb did, but I'm never going to do that. And this keeps happening. So then the son goes away to college, he comes back, and the father says, listen, you, you got your degree now, so why don't you take over the books of the ranch for us? Would you just take over the books, the financial books? And the son says, sure. So he's doing the books one day, the father comes in from the field, and the son says, hey, Dad, um, sit down, Dad. Um, I've been going over the books, you know, like you asked, and, and I wanted to ask you something. And, um, you know, Dad, we all have blind spots. We all have blind spots, Dad. And um, you don't have that knife with you, do you? Oh, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> But I was going over the books, and, and, and Dad, um, you have a habit, um, um, habit, just, just a habit, it's a little thing, um, that every time one of our firstborn uh, has a, uh, uh, one of our animals has a firstborn, you um, uh, kill it. And um, uh, I was just wondering, um, Dad, uh, why do you do that? And Because I've been looking at the books, Dad. Um, Dad, you killed 74 animals last year, 74. Uh, and we're in the ranching business, Dad. This is cutting into our profits. 
So why do you do that? Now, think about this. Exodus 13, God says, your son's going to ask you. And when you do, you tell him that you were slaves in Egypt. And that with a mighty hand, God redeemed you. And that's why you do it. So, so this father says to the son, son, um, I need to tell you something about our family that, that you don't know. Uh, we weren't always in the ranching business. We didn't own animals. We didn't own land. Um, son, we were slaves. We were in bondage, and we could not get out on our own. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed your family and has given us everything that we have. Therefore, we gladly give to God the firstborn. Okay, so years ago... Um, I was doing the bills, and it was back before we had online banking, and I, I would write the check, the tithe check first, and then I would settle over to the side. I'd always write it first, settle over to the side, then take it to church with me on the weekend, and then I'd pay the bills, but I'd always write tithe check first. Okay, for you younger people here, we used to have pieces of paper called checks. <laughs> it's before plastic was invented, and it's when we rode dinosaurs to school. So, but anyway... Um, so, so I written the tie check, put it over the side, and now I'm paying the bills, and my son comes in who has a math mind, and he can read, and he, he's about nine or 10 years old, and he sees the church, and he sees the amount of the check, and he says to me, Dad, why are you giving this much money to the church? And I remembered Exodus 13. And my son remembers this. And I took my son and I put him on my lap and I said to him, um, son, there's something about daddy that you don't know. But daddy wasn't always a Christian. And daddy was a very bad man. And daddy could not stop being bad. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed your daddy. And that's why I gladly give God the first of everything we have. Orlean and I were just tremendously blessed by the, just the clarity so many of the different topics of giving. Again, just giving. You give and you shall receive. It's like if you're kind, people are kind to you. If you're kind of a monster and intolerant and judgmental, you always are curious why people around you are so judgmental. These concepts of giving and tithing, tithing's never been um, an issue or a problem for Orlean and I. When I, because, you know, I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, when I got saved, learning the principles of God, tithing has been an easy thing. I started when I was first a Christian. I became a Christian. I worship God. I give him my tithe. But the one thing that I never really truly understood he, with such clarity, and I like the idea that down through the years, I've heard so many people say, well, tithing is not a New Testament thing. I love the way he just called it, a, a, it's all a bunch of dung. He said, don't, don't get sucked into that. It's because it's really above and beyond the concept of 10%. It really has to do with the principle of first. I've never heard that emphasized to that degree before. And I have to admit, when I got home, I'm, I'm really old-fashioned. I still do my books with a ledger, piece of paper, open up 13-column ledger, and I do that. Anybody like that anymore? Some of you, you can actually relate. Okay, so, so I do that. That's how I do my books. And because Orlean and I, as ministers, our tithe goes into the district office, so I will send it in every couple months. And in my ledger, it's, you know, living and then utilities and house payment, and I just have it listed all of us. Well, because I don't write checks out of there that often, I, have it, I used to have the tithe on the end column over here. And I have to admit, I'm sitting here watching and listening to the message, and God knows it's a, it's a, it's a heart not to be legalistic about anything, but I really felt challenged and convicted to say, no, it's, it's first. It's literally the first thing I write. 
Because you've heard me say almost every offering we take, I gladly give you. Father, I recognize this is representative of everything I have because it's all yours. And he would really, God would answer back according to what he just said. He'd say, no, the first tenth is mine. The rest is yours. You can give what you want, but this other is mine. And I expect you to return it. And so with that, I literally redid my books, re retitled them and everything else. And I just want to let you know that it's not this idea of give to get, but I've experienced, like, I've just sensed from God a nod. Just a nod of pleasure. And what a great way to live. And that's why his book entitled The Blessed Life, you know, is, 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 it's not about tithing. It's about living with acknowledging that God is first place in our life. Amen? Praise God. It's 1201. Wow, did we cook. We really covered a lot of material, and we just squeezed it all in. But I hope and pray, and I'm going to pray right now, that God would have his way in our life, in your life, in my life, that he truly would be preeminent, that he would be first place in every aspect of it. Amen? Praise God. Heavenly Father, as we're going to be leaving this place and be dismissed, we acknowledge that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are above all things. And as we call ourselves your children, we pray that we would live a life where you truly are preeminent, where you are first. That like Abel, we will bring to you the first of the first. And not like Cain, that we'll just give you if and whenever we choose. Father, that when they're in the morning, we'll be the first, you'll be the first that we praise. The first words of our mouth will be worship and adoration to you. That in our heart, you will be first. Because Father, we acknowledge that everything that we have belongs to you. And Father, I pray even now that your Holy Spirit would begin to challenge. And, and I know that like Orlean and I sitting in this conference, I know the Holy Spirit that you are making Everything from major adjustments in people's hearts and minds and their principles to minor little adjustments, like me moving in my column from the last to the first. Father, I pray that you would have your way in every one of our hearts and lives, and we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.